Hello and welcome to the SIBO webinar, Demystifying Carbon Credits, Carbon Markets, and Carbon Farming. Today is June 30, 2021, and I am your host, Billy Kripe. Thank you very much for joining me and my very special guest, Stephen Lemeshaw, to this SIBO webinar series. Um, before we get started, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping with you all. As a reminder, this is a discussion. There are a couple uh, slides in this presentation and the presentation is being recorded so that you can watch this at your leisure. If you've joined with us live today, we do have a live Q&A session. So please use the question box on your Bright Talk screen panel to submit your questions. They will be in writing. And as we go through the, the discussion in the, in the chat today, as those questions um, are germane to topics that we're currently talking about and as they come up, we will inject them into the conversation and also address them at the end of the presentation for any that have been uh, um, left until that, until that part. If you are watching online, if you're watching this on demand, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join us please do visit SIBOtechnologies.com and click on our resource center to see the follow-up blog post where we do address the questions that were answered in this presentation um, in, a, in a more lengthy uh, and more, maybe more detailed format. Our goal today with, uh, with you, Stephen, is to really set a um, set a baseline. Let's start some common understanding. Let's do some demystification, some definition work. We're not going to go deep down into, into science like we have with, with some other of our presentations. Um, we're not going to, uh, you know, get all, you know, philosophical about this, but we do want to try to disambiguate, to, um, to help understand what is, um, you know, what, what is, carbon farming all about? What are carbon credits? What are the different types of carbon um, offsets and insets and incentives that are out there? What's the role of regenerative agriculture when it comes to understanding carbon markets and, and carbon credits and ultimately carbon farming? Um, those are all uh, a part of our goals for this webinar. And um, before we get into the topics here, uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not invite um, all of you watching to also uh, sign up and register for our upcoming um, webinar and expert panel discussions. On July 15th, we have uh, Transforming the Future of Agriculture with Crop Modeling. We will get um, into some more of the details of the... Uh, of, of the big data and the AI and the modeling and simulation from our computer scientists. We've got some of the leading crop modelers in the world joining us um, there, Dr. Kofi uh, Dotsi and um, crop modeling scientist uh, Nalov uh, uh, Chatterjee, both from SIBO Technologies. And we'll be getting into the details of crop modeling. That's on July 15th. And also it will be on demand. And then on July 28th, we are going to um, go deep down into understanding kind of the whole landscape of carbon and climate initiatives, the programs, the protocols, the different initiatives that are out there. This is not something where we're going to be talking as much about SIBO technologies, but rather let's get a lay of the land and understand um, what's going to be, uh, you know, what is in place and what is coming and how these programs are evolving. Both of these sessions, um, Transforming the Future of Ag with Crop Modeling and Understanding the Carbon and Climate Initiatives programs will be very, very informative right there in the, in the height of the growing season before harvest. So take some time and uh, join us for those as well. But today, right now, uh, Steve, thanks so much for taking the time out um, with us. You are the director of the carbon product here at SIBO Technologies. Why don't you give us a little bit of a, of a story of your background and interest in sustainability, and then we can dive into um, our, our topics today. 
Sure. Um, so nice to meet everyone. I'm Steve Lemeshaw. As, as Billy mentioned, I direct our carbon product at SIBO. Uh, I've been at the company for about six months and I have a, a tech background. So I spent um, over eight years at Google uh, working, you know, on a variety of different projects, most recently Ways Carpool. Um, and, you know, most of the work that I've done on carbon has sort of been a side, uh, you know, project capacity until SIBO. Um, but, you know, this has been a long time passion of mine. Um, you know, dating all the way back to probably high school when I first saw Inconvenient Truth and I realized, you know, how big of a problem we had on our hands. So, um, you know, it's exciting for me to finally be able to dedicate 100% of myself to something that I see as, you know, really the most important issue that we as a society face today. Well, and that's a, that's a great, um, that's a great segue. Let's talk about this. So we are going to talk about, um, you know, carbon markets, carbon credits, and carbon farming, those kind of really the three main topics we want to make sure that we're covering here in that order, carbon markets, carbon credits, and then carbon farming. Um, so for those of you who are live and, and joining with us, um, you know, think about the questions that you may have for, uh, for Stephen or for myself or that we can pass on to our data scientists and crop scientists after this meeting. Um, but Steve, you know, Carbon markets, carbon credits, carbon farm, you know, there's a there's a huge amount of interest in this, um, you know, just within the last 24 hours. I did, right before this session, I did a quick uh, search of any of the news articles just, that just mention um, carbon farming. And it's it's literally hundreds of news articles in the last 24 hours that have just come out about this. And that's not unusual. There's nothing that was that was you know new and unique that happened within the last 24 hours to spur this news cycle. It's just there's that much interest. Well, when it, when you think about it, I mean that's that's great, right? At SIBO, we we love that. But what's kind of driving this interest in in carbon, um, you know, in in carbon farming and carbon markets? Like why why do you think that we care now so much about this as a as a society? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think a lot of this stems back to sort of, you know, the recognition, um, you know, globally, not just in the United States, uh, of how big of a challenge climate change really is. Um, you know, close to 200 nations signed on to the Paris Climate Accord uh, several years ago now. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a recognition that you know, the vast majority of Americans now support, uh, you know, environmental regulation and, and list, you know, those protections as a top, you know, policy priority. Uh, you know, most many of the Fortune 500 companies have signed on to real measurable climate commitments. And so I think, you know, the, the interest in carbon markets is really sort of an artifact of the excitement and momentum around doing something about climate change. Um, you know, I saw a funny, funny tweet the other day that was, you know, reframing climate change is just a, a series of, of regionalized apocalypses, right? And so, um, you know, if we need to rebrand it, you know, as in a way that mobilizes um, our society to do it, then, then that's fine. Um, and I think that people now really since Paris uh, and the Climate Accord have, have really started to think uh, more strategically about what do we do about it? Um, and a lot of people have pointed to these market, you know, sort of uh, um, mechanisms to do it. And a, car a, car a carbon market is a great uh, opportunity for us to use a tool that's already in place that already exists to make a real impact and support an industry or a variety of different industries uh, like agriculture uh, in a way that can be positive uh, for everyone. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a really good point. And, you know, on the, on the slide here that, that we've got showing, you know, this isn't just something that's being compelled by, by governments, you know, saying, you know, uh, you know, certain industries or certain companies must conform with, with this regulation or with that particular goal. But we're seeing an, a, an amazing increase in the volume of household name companies who are coming out and saying, um, yeah, we're, we're pledging to be net zero. We're pledging to be carbon neutral. We're pledging to be, um, you know, climate positive by such and such a date. There's a, there's a, a renewed focus voluntarily um, by big organizations and individuals as well that, you know, what they, they don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for government to tell us what to do in order to make a, an impact, a positive impact on, um, you know, on, on climate. 
Completely agree. Yeah. I mean, again, and this is not, it is becoming less of a political issue as well. I think that there's a recognition um, across, you know, the entire political spectrum that we need to do something about this and doing so in a voluntary capacity in a way that mobilizes the private sector alongside, you know, individuals um, and the government to, to, to come together and, and find a practical solution uh, is, is very inspiring. It, it, it really is. And, you know, what's, what's interesting um, you know, what's, what's interesting there is that when it comes to, you know, the, the politics of it, of course, here in, in the United States, just a, a couple of days ago, the U S Senate passed the growing climate solutions act is overwhelming bipartisan support, you know, not just kind of narrow margins, but, you know, something I think 93 or 96% of all of the, um, senators voting for it. It still hasn't passed the house yet, but, um, just overwhelming bipartisan support. And when, we come to regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, it's regenerative agriculture, which of, of course is core to the SIBO Technologies mission. But regenerative agriculture has a very big and profound impact on uh, on carbon farming, on carbon markets, on carbon credits, and and on soil regeneration and replenishment. So this is one of the areas I think where we are helping, we, you know, we're aligning the, the values and the needs of American farmers with the values and needs of um, organizations who are, you know, have carbon and climate commitments with kind of the overall uh, values and needs to make a, a positive impact when it comes to, to climate change. Um, you know, I often say, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, people are hard pressed to find, you know, a, a farmer who they who they don't like. I mean, who doesn't like farmers and farming and helping, um, you know, people produce better soils, better food, better food that our food eats, um, and and a healthier population. It's one of these things where it just makes sense across the board, um, without having to wield kind of a big regulatory stick in order to to get compliance. So. That's right. I mean, I think re regenerative agriculture is one of those things that, you know, we, we uh, talk about as having, you know, co-benefits or, or stacked co-benefits, right? So, yes, it is a climate solution. Yes, we can sequester carbon in the soil and that carbon happens to make um, agricultural land more productive and healthier and more resilient. But there's all these other benefits of it as well. Uh, you know, things like biodiversity or, um, you know, providing another revenue stream to, to growers who are already operating on thin margins. I mean, right. if we can find a solution like regenerative agriculture that is inspiring on so many levels, then it just makes practical sense for something that we should pursue. It's not easy. And we'll talk more about why that is. Right. Uh, but it, it is important for us to figure out. Well, let's dive into some of that that demystification. Let's let's talk a little bit about carbon markets. And so, for the next couple minutes, let's work to demystify what carbon markets are all about. Um, you know, there's there's um, uh, well, we have a we have a slide here. Why don't I bring those? Um, why don't I bring those back up, kind of as a as a guide for us to talk. Really, there's compliance markets, right? And then there's voluntary uh, carbon carbon markets. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the the difference between those two, or how are they, or you know what what they work on, and we can um, riff on there? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that the the primary thing to understand is just that a compliance market is a is a regulated market. It is required uh, for you know those that are under that guidance to be to participate. Uh, there's no choice about it. Um, and, you know, that can mean a bunch of different things. You know, there could be price guidance. There could be, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, standardization that is defined specifically by, you know, the governing body. Um, but, you know, then the other side of that is a, a voluntary market. Right. So this is kind of the, the space that we're in right now within agriculture in the United States. Uh, it's not regulated. It's not enforced. Um, and, you know, it's still early days. Uh, so those that are purchasing these credits to, you know, offset their own, you know, greenhouse gas footprint um, are doing so in a voluntary capacity, um, either because they, they care very much about this space. Um, they care about their impact on climate. Um, or you know they they see the writing on the wall that at some point in the future this could become a regulated regulated compliance market. So that's kind of where we are you know right now. Um, again, and, and and voluntary markets sometimes have a way of becoming regulatory markets in the future. 
Right, right. Um, you know, and when we when we think about you know kind of the difference between you know regulatory markets and and institutional compliance markets, I think that that notion of the um, you know of the big stick of regulation kind of requiring that an industry or a company do some things in order to offset their carbon footprint um, is, uh, is, is, is important, right? We just saw the, um, the Dutch court rule, I believe um, it was, uh, I, I think it was just within the last month um, against Exxon Mobil saying that they have to step up some of their efforts Mm -hmm. um there and so that's an example of an of an international um regulation on a you know on a foreign co uh, company um but it was also a you know kind of a bellwether for a lot of the other organizations other companies in that in that industry sector but when we come to voluntary or private voluntary um markets um you know we can we can talk about uh, you, you know, a, a lot of the startup works. That's the it's the space that Cibo Technologies is in. It's a lot of the space that a lot of the um, or uh, the the other carbon farming um, platforms and and technology markets are in. Um, no one is coming out and saying you must buy carbon uh, credits or carbon offsets from you know from regenerative ag. At least not yet. Um, and there's a perception, I think, that voluntary carbon markets are complex or are difficult to understand. Um, you know, can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how how voluntary carbon markets as, you know, especially for voluntary um, ag carbon markets are kind of leading the way to make things simple? Yeah, I think, you know, and part one of the challenges here, I just point out is that, you know, part of the reason um, that they're complex is because there's very little guidance right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of different players with, you know, mixed, sometimes overlapping messages around, you know, the way that things should work um, or, you know, the, the way that they've built out their methodologies. Uh, and you know, because of that, I think it, it creates quite a bit of confusion. Right. So, you know, within the context of a voluntary carbon market, we have, um, you know, at this point, players out there that are sort of making their own definitions and coming to market with, you know, credits that they de they deem to be, um, you know, credible. Uh, and then there are platforms um, or entities out there, NGOs that specifically focus on facilitating this. So, you know, there are registries. Uh, you know, Vera, Gold Standard, um, you know, Climate Action Reserve or CAR, they all do this. They, they create standards or protocols that are designed to help sort of, you know, demystify and, and, and uh, ensure that, you know, the credits that are being transacted are, are credible and they're valid uh, and that they've undergone a, a sufficient amount of uh, rigor and, and oversight so that, you know, people aren't getting boondoggled and purchasing something that's not real. And I think that's incredibly important to exist. Uh, and, you know, because of that, you know, because that we, we really need to, to, to define how valid uh, these credits are, and prove it, in some cases, it's overly rigorous. And I think that, you know, the position we're in within agriculture right now is that, you know, our desire to ensure that that these credits are valid is actually preventing in some say, in some ways the market from fully taking off right now. And so, you know, it, it, as we sort of move into a space where perhaps there's more regulation or there's more, you know, sort of uh, government um, mandated uh, structure or definition, you know, that will help, I think, in some ways to find what will be acceptable in a way that doesn't, you know, prevent um, participation from, from many of the growers that would like to participate in these markets. Right. And I think that's, I think that's an important point that, that you make there, right? The first is to, you know, to really understand that the, there's a, a, a gradient or a, a variation in the, you know, there's a continuum of what a, a carbon credit is based on its verification and where it comes from and how long it's, you know, how much carbon and how long that carbon is represented to stay kind of in, in place where, you know, where it's being um, uh, sequestered or how much is being avoided permanently, that, that sort of thing. Um, and 
there's a number of these organizations and programs and protocols that are coming out saying, you know, we've got a way to do it or we've got a way to do it. And there's not, you know, a, a kind of a two plus two equals four um, uh, consensus around, you know, this is good and that's bad. I think everybody agrees we ought to be doing something and there's different ways of, of measuring that and and identifying it. In fact, that's what our webinar at the end of July will be covering is kind of looking at the landscape of all of those different um, carbon programs and, and protocols. Mm -hmm. And when it comes into that voluntary carbon marketplace, spurring participation and making it easy for people to engage both on the supply side and in our case, farmers and growing operations and on the demand side, whether that's individuals or businesses who want to buy carbon or, re, you know, regenerative ag units or offsets or insets, they want to buy, they want to make a transaction that has to be easy um, because at the end of the day, as a society, you know, we're used to buying and selling things in a, in a very easy and efficient manner, right? Amazon has made that, um, you know, very popular and, and easy for us. We've been conditioned to make that, uh, you know, to make those transactions easy. And the sign up and the growing uh, process has to be easy as as well and cost effective. Right. Um, I, I would just add, Billy, that, you know, we're in a place right now within the ag-based carbon markets. It's still very new, right? And there yeah. is a huge amount of uncertainty in terms of, you know, how long soil carbon is sequestered in the ground and what sort of things can release it and, you know, what sort of practices we need to uh, require to ensure that, you know, we're, we're warehousing enough carbon to actually have a real tangible impact on climate. Uh, you know, the, the, the protocols related to, you know, um, agricultural carbon uh, on Vera and CAR were released within the past year. And, and at this point, there are still very, very few projects that have been accepted to allow for credit generation uh, within them. And so, you know, we're still in a point right now where we're defining what is an, ex an acceptable level of uncertainty uh, mm -hmm. as it relates to, you know, that the soil carbon. Uh, and, and sort of the impacts there. And so while we're defining that, it makes it challenging, I think, to, to, to truly incentivize growers to take on these practices when it's a little bit of a moving target in terms of, you know, what they can earn and whether they're going to be able to recoup their investment. That's a, that's a, really, good, that's a really good point. And it, it speaks to one of the questions that has come through. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who are watching live, please do um, type your questions into the question box. And as they come up and are relevant to the topic that uh, Stephen is discussing, we'll, we'll address them here. And I think this is time to talk a little bit in more detail about Vera and CAR. The question that came through was how are Vera and CAR regulated? How do we know that their reporting is accurate and that there's no conflict of interest? Um, you care to comment a little bit about uh, about that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, as, as far as I know, they are not regulated. Um, so there's no governing body. I mean, they, they're acting in a sense as the regulators within an unregulated marketplace. Uh, and so, you know, they need to establish credibility um, within the space. And largely they've done that by hiring experts and by working with, you know, those who really understand the space to develop, um, you know, the protocols and methodologies required to generate carbon credits. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that's, it's important. It's an interesting question. I mean, you know, there, there's no, if there were, if this were a compliance market, there would be some regulation that would, you know, help define that. Um, as of now, I, I don't know of anything beyond, you know, the, their own credibility being on the line to ensure that, you know, they're doing things efficaciously. Well, and, and at the end of the day, right, this is, it, it's all based on science. And so the, the science is repeatable. The science is testable. The, the scientific methodologies are, they're, they're not hidden. It's not a black box. Um, and you have, uh, you know, a growing uh, consensus, uh, uh, an already massive but, and growing consensus of global uh, scientists who are implementing the, you know, the, the formula and the methodologies and the, the testing criteria and the different protocols to actually say, yep, no, this, this actually does work. Um, and it's a matter, I think, at this point of, you know, not, it's not about, you know, is there is there a conflict of interest in place or is there fraud in place, but more about is one going to be better than the other? And I think that's a great place to be in because that means we're always going to have incremental improvement, just like we do in in other market spaces, right? In technology markets, right? We're not still sticking at the, you know, at the first generation iPhone. We're on to 
12 um, because there's constant innovation. And guess what? It's not just Apple with an iPhone. It's also Samsung and Google and all of the other um, you know, technology makers there. So there's, you know, that incremental improvement, which is, which I think it's a good, it's a good place to be. And the science is able to be, you know, reproduced by, you know, by anybody who's interested. And it's certainly the approach that we've taken here at SIBO Technologies with our own, um, you know, highly qualified, uh, you know, um, group of, of scientists that run from climate scientists to crop modelers to soil scientists and all of the um, you know, all of the above. So um, it's it's not a matter of opinion or philosophy or conjecture as much as, uh, you know, testing rigor and always looking for the next best methodology. Um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, and this is going to be an iterative process, right? And uh, I think is. I expect to see changes within those protocols as, as they develop. Again, this is the first sort of go at trying to, to do this. And so we need to determine, you know, what, what, what needs to change moving forward in order to unlock these markets. Um, but by and large, I think that, you know, what, what's been put out there so far is, 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 is really great stuff. Yeah. Um, any, any comments on gold standard? Another, another question from a, a, a viewer um right now and um and, and again i'll remind our our viewers whether you're viewing now or watching this on demand that we do have another webinar planned right now for the end of july where we will go into depth on all of the different programs and protocols um <laughs> we mentioned vera we mentioned car any comments on gold standard uh, gold standard is, is sort of the the other uh, the third in the big three uh as i like to call them um you know gold standard has a very very high um standard, you know, in terms of the, the way that they view these markets. Um, and I think that, you know, as it relates to offsets with an aggregate, they've taken a little bit more of a wait and see approach um, because of some of that uncertainty that I was referring to earlier. And so CAR and, and Vera have, have uh, sort of released their protocols and, you know, Vera calls it the, uh, you know, VM42 uh, and, and uh, CAR is, is the, you know, soil and land enrichment uh, protocol. Um, and you know, I think that when you look at gold standard, they've taken a slightly different approach in that they're looking um, more heavily at, at sort of scope three uh, programs, so things that are more focused on supply chain, um, you know, emissions reduction and mitigation, uh, and defining you know more protocols and, and regulations there, um, which I think is also very important and something that that CBO is looking very closely at. Well, why don't we take some time to turn now to our next topic? Um, we've done a little bit of an overview of carbon markets. We've talked about um, there are institutional compliance markets, which are governed by regulation and um, have some, uh, some compulsory um, capabilities or, or uh, feeders into them. And then the private voluntary markets like SIBO Technologies and like a lot of the car, um, ag-based carbon markets right now, where you can um, voluntarily enroll, you can voluntarily purchase a, a carbon credit or a, an emissions reduction unit um, and off and, and they are real and they are really, uh, you know, offsetting or counting for a certain amount of carbon that has been sequestered, uh, but they don't have the, um, the, the, the compulsory uh, nat uh, nature of the, of the compliance markets. Um, and so you can, feel good that the science is solid, um, but you can't necessarily use it to, uh, you know, answer a, a judgment from the Hague. <laughs> um, when we talked a little bit about those uh, compliance markets and the voluntary markets, let's turn our attention now to understanding, you know, what is a carbon credit? Um, you know, what, what is, what is that thing that, that we loosely call a, a carbon credit? And, um, maybe Stephen, you could talk a little bit about how there are some, you know, some different names for carbon credits or, um, sure. Emissions units and things like that. Yeah. So I, I would just start by saying that typically a carbon credit is equivalent to one ton of carbon or, or carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2 equivalent. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, the idea is that that ton uh, is not being emitted into, you know, the, the atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is, this represents sort of 
um, or, you know, the reduction or avoidance of uh, carbon that would have otherwise been emitted. Um, you know, we'll come back to this slide, but I think it's important to sort of, you know, define, you know, how, you know, there's a lot of conversation around offsets and insets um, and how they're different from one another. I think, you know, when, when we're thinking about offsets, I think the, the first thing to, to point out is that, you know, typically an offset is defined by, you know, an emissions reduction credit that's generated kind of by a project developer. And then it's sold uh, separately, almost as a permission structure to pollute to someone else. Okay. So, you know, you can think of like a big tech company who has lots of emissions associated uh, with their, you know, their, their, their um, servers. And, um, you know, they could be purchasing offsets from a completely different industry um, to offset the pollution that they've emitted. Uh, and that could be either, you know, um, that they've chosen to admit or that are completely unavoidable as part of, you know, their operations. And so the idea there is that, you know, an offset would um, allow for an organization that is polluting to essentially write off that pollution because of, uh, you know, a, a, a purchase of an offset elsewhere. Uh, and I like to point out again that, that it, it does in some ways, it is in some ways a, a permission structure uh, to pollute because we're just agreeing that it is, it is acceptable for that pollution to go into the atmosphere. Um, doesn't mean that offsets aren't great and that they serve an important purpose. Um, but, you know, Billy, you, you and I were talking a little bit about sort of the bathtub analogy uh, mm -hmm. earlier. And I think it's, 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 it's a useful one in terms of, you know, how we should be prioritizing our efforts um, um, around reducing emissions. Um, do you want to do you want to give that yeah. example? Yeah, yeah, that was I. It was a, a part of an article that um, that that we had been reading uh, just a little bit earlier today, and and the analogy goes something like this, right? If there's if your bathtub in your in your house is is overflowing, um, you know, it makes sense to both turn off the the spigot as well as get a sponge. Um, and, 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 you know, applying that metaphor to, to carbon credits and carbon markets, right? A carbon offset is the sponge, right? You're literally doing, you know, taking something outside to soak up the, the overflow and, um, you know, the insetting activity, um, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing, um, you know, the, the, the pollution that, that you're emitting through changing of, of processes. That's equivalent to turning off the, the spigot, stopping the processes that cause the pollution or reducing them. Um, and, you know, contrary to, to you know, th this gets to be a, a, a kind of somewhat of a contentious debate sometimes when people say, well, you know, you should turn off the overflow. And other people say, no, we need the sponges. And the, the real answer, I think, is, well, it's both. If you're in a situation in your bathroom and your bathtub is overflowing, yes, turn off the spigot and make sure that you've got the sponge. You've got to do both things. And if for whatever reason you can't turn off that faucet, if the if the water is going to continue to overflow, maybe there's a pipe burst there or you can only get it so much and it's going to keep on, on leaking, you do the best you can until you can overhaul the entire system. And meanwhile, you get the sponges and you clean and you keep on uh, you know, soaking up that that overflow right so there's a really important lesson here um you know we're we're you know people who are and, and organizations who are maybe vested in one approach or the other uh, maybe lose sight you know maybe lose the the forest for the trees or the the ears of corn for the fields of of corn in in our wheel in our world um but it's important to have both both parts of the solution it's really about um being able to to offset and absorb the the carbon equivalent that is being or carbon dioxide equivalent that's being released into the atmosphere, and making those changes in our processes and in our supply chains and across our value sheds that are going to actually um, reduce and prevent the uh, and, and avoid the emissions of of greenhouse causing gases. All of those are part of a very important um, solution. It's not either or, it's really yeah. a and. But there, I mean, there is in some ways an order of operations here. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 
important as an organization that's making a climate commitment to first examine one's own operations and one's own supply chain and figure out are, are there ways that we can reduce our footprint um, you know directly right can we can we work on um, you know on, on procuring a, a, a more efficient fleet of cars to deliver our products is it you know can we uh, procure you know renewable energy as part of our scope two emissions uh, and then finally for scope three I mean are there ways that we can work with our suppliers you know the the growers that are, are growing the grain that go into the crackers that we put into the market to work with them to reduce their footprint Right. And so um, I think that that there's a growing recognition that that in setting or you know, sort of scope three uh, emissions management is uh, extremely important and maybe even the first thing that you should try and do. And if there's no additional opportunity, if you've exhausted your sort of financially feasible options um, for reducing emissions within you know, your scope one and two and three, then go outside of that scope and offset the rest. Right. Uh, so it's important to look at like all options, as you mentioned. Um, but that's sort of how I think about the differences here of a carbon offset versus a carbon inset. Um, and, you know, a lot of, there is a lot of conversation about both right now. And so this is there's and before we get into scope one, two and three emissions, because that's a really interesting topic for um, for demystification here. But before we get into that, right, when we talk about what is a carbon credit, you had said before, right, a carbon credit is equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent that is uh, sequestered or avoided. Um, and what that, you know, what that means for regenerative agriculture, for carbon farming, is that that one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent is um, uh, re reduced or, or avoided or sequestered is going to come from the actual processes and practices of farming. One of those practices and processes is the actual growth of plants, right? As plants grow, they, they consume and, and metabolize carbon dioxide and they can store it in their root structure and in the, in the uh, soil down, down below. That's, that's one piece. Um, some other pieces are doing things like uh, conservation tillage, right? When uh, growers are running their, their tractors and their machinery over the fields, um, churning up that soil with a conventional till will release carbon dioxide, all that, anything that's stored in that soil up into the, up into the atmosphere. A conservation tillage does less of that and a no-till approach does um, no churning of of that um, of, of that of that soil, mm -hmm. um, and so all of those sorts of practices, and there are many other practices, help to uh, reduce, avoid, and sequester carbon dioxide through the course of those of those farming practices. And when we talk about regenerative agriculture, when we use that term. Those practices that re, that reduce, avoid, and um, sequester carbon dioxide in the soil also have a really big benefit to the soil health, the biome itself as well. And those improvements, th those practices actually improve the soil. They can enrich the soil that's there. They can actually help to grow the amount of topsoil, rich topsoil that is that is present. Um, it reduces erosion. It reduces, uh, you know, um, leaching and and flow of of inputs, chemical inputs, and fertilizers and things like that, off into the into the watershed. Um, and ultimately, what it what regenerative agriculture does for the for the grower is to create healthier soils, create more climate resilient crops. It actually has a measurable impact, a positive impact on yield. Um, for the for the crops that are that are being grown, um, and it, you know overall it it just it helps create a better agricultural product, mm -hmm. and it has all of these climate benefits as well, which is why when we talk about you know SIBO's mission is to scale regenerative agriculture, it's really this this win win situation for the grower. You're improving the the soil. You're improving the yield. You're making healthier, more nutrient dense um, products, and reducing uh, input costs in in many cases, and potentially creating a new revenue stream through carbon farming by being able to 
quantify and then ultimately produce and sell carbon credits as another, I know, as, as another commodity. And yet I would just point out that these practices are still not widely adopted uh, within the space. You're right. There are all these stacked benefits, but on their own, they haven't demonstrated enough value or enough sort of financial uh, incentive to really propel, you know, propel, you know, wide scale adoption of cover cropping and reduced tillage and reduced nitrogen. So, you know, there is something locking up this transition. I think that we will eventually see it. I hope that we will. But, you know, that's why something like a carbon market is so important. Right. And, you know, that's, you know, ultimately the, the, the additionality that we need to show to demonstrate that a carbon credit is valid um, is essentially th that exactly, right? Which is that we're, we're providing value, value that is ultimately inspiring the grower to make the change. If those other stacked benefits, all the things that you just mentioned, Billy, reduce input costs, et cetera, aren't enough on their own, well, then we need something else. And that's really what these carbon credits are for. Uh, so even though they're getting value, you know, it's, it hasn't been enough. Only something like 5% of growers at this point in the U.S. are doing cover crops. We need that number to be way higher. Uh, and so I think because of that, we're able to show that additionality does exist here. And just what you're, what you're seeing on the screen is just that, um, you know, these are sort of four of the key uh, kind of components um, of a carbon credit. You need to demonstrate that these exist uh, in order for a credit to be valid. Um, you know, additionality is the, the idea that it, it would not have happened otherwise. Right. Um, you know, and, and some of the important kind of pieces to, to look at uh, as it relates to regenerative agriculture is did, was this practice already adopted in the past? So typically with, you know, uh, um, you know, the different carbon registries, uh, they require that it is a net new practice uh, this year. Um, and that's the reason why is because we need to show that they haven't done it otherwise. They didn't already do it. Um, because they they saw the incentives uh, already you know were already on the table for them, um, you know they also have to show like is this a, a common practice already? Is everyone already doing this? You know there are certain sort of regenerative practices that um, most of the market has already adopted, right? I think that something like seventy percent of growers at this point are doing some type of reduced tillage typically, um, you know, and so it's it's hard to demonstrate that we should be able to provide you know financial resources for something that, you know, most people are already doing. Um, so really it's, you know, additionality is all about what is the reason that the, this, this practice is happening and can we show that the carbon credit had a material impact on its adoption? Um, a couple others to, to, to mention is permanence. Um, you know, we need to be able to show that, that this carbon credit is a permanent impact, right? It's not just a, um, you know, a temporary thing. We need to show that, you know, there is a long-term lasting impact um, from the storage. And so that's where a lot of the uncertainty comes in as it relates to soil carbon and to these marketplaces is that, you know, um, it's hard to prove that your, you know, a, a new practice regime will yield an absolutely permanent, um, a drawdown of carbon that will be stored in soil forever. It's not as if you're creating a rock and putting it on a scale and then putting it in, you know, on your desk or something like that. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's why there's all sorts of different components built in to our, you know, the different uh, um, registries that require um, that we evaluate, you know, what sort of opportunity costs are there for a grower? You know, if the price of corn goes way up, what's the likelihood that they're going to change their practices back? What sort of environmental factors are there? If there's a major drought, does does that have an impact on soil carbon? We have to evaluate that. Um, you know, buffer pools, investing schedules, you know, how much of the, the, the credit do we just withhold in perpetuity to ensure that if there is a reversal uh, and that carbon gets re-released back into the atmosphere that, that you know, we're, we're accounting for that. And then vesting schedules, right? We want to create an incentive schedule or an incentive structure that, you know, has the grower that continues to do these practices year in and year out and will continue to reap the rewards. Uh, a couple others to mention, leakage, uh, you know, did the reduction here cause an increase there? Is it truly net negative or did, you know, the adoption of these practices over here, you know, just yield some other practice uh, on a different part of their land um, to, to, you know, account for, you know, maybe a yield hit or something like that. Is it a reduction or is it a reallocation? Um, any, any comments on that stuff, Billy? Um, yeah, I would just say that, you know, this is where, the, the agricultural markets really have an opportunity uh, to, to shine and where SIBO is taking a, 
a really innovative and thought leadership approach here as we talk to the, the market, as we talk to growers, as we talk to companies, as we talk to legislators and regulators and bureaucrats, and we're having all those conversations because things like you know, additionality in the energy markets, which a lot of the early carbon markets were designed for, um, and, and with those in mind, additionality in those markets is re you know, really not able to be uh, applied, um, you know, equally to, to agriculture. Agriculture is inherently an annual seasonal activity. Um, you know, in, in, in some cases, um, you know, the, the, the additionality is happening at some level every single year because every single year a brand new decision is made about what to plant how to plant the you know the the prevalence of um of renting fields uh, uh in in some way shape or form means that there's a lot of ownership changes and so while the field is the same field or the parcel is the same parcel the practices on that parcel have to be evaluated you know every single uh every single year and so that's where the agriculture um, uh, carbon markets and the regenerative ag-based markets really have an opportunity to to shine and to take a, a leadership stance. That's what what SIBO Technologies is doing. We're doing that in partnership with the um, you know with the programs and the protocols like like you had mentioned before, like Vera and, and Gold Standard and, and CAR, and with some of the other uh, players in this in this space as well. And I think it's a good. Uh, point now to ask one of the questions that's coming from um, from one of our viewers about, you know, what is the average cost or and value of a carbon credit right now? Um, and, you know, this is, this is, I think this speaks directly, Steve, to your point about, hey, there's a cost of doing regenerative ag or of doing practices that can uh, help to offset and sequester and reduce and avoid carbon emissions. Um, what is what is that what is that price? Mm. Um, do you want to talk to that? I've got a, a chart pulled up on my other computer over here that that we could um, talk to if, uh, if if you want to as well. Sure. I mean, if, if you want to bring that up, uh, you know, please do, and I can speak a little bit to it uh, while you do that. Um, it's 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 a, it's a really important question that was asked, and I think you know um, we have to understand that that you know the adoption of these practices are not cheap, especially when you're doing it for the first time, right? So, you know, not there, there are costs of equipment, there are costs of, you know, cover crop seeds, there are the costs of potentially taking a hit to your yield if, you know, you don't completely optimize it in the first couple of years. Typically, that normalizes after a couple of years, but, you know, in the first few, you've got to figure out exactly what the best, uh, you know, kind of cover crop mix and, you know, uh, uh, you know sort of practice regime is in order to optimize um, you know, for your land. And so, you know, we've seen upwards of costs of, of north of $50 per acre. Um, you know, the typical average cost of a carbon credit uh, in sort of our voluntary markets here in the U.S. is less than $10. So we're talking probably about $7.50, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, those are higher in regulated markets. Uh, you know, we've seen upwards of, of somewhere around $25. Um, and, you know, the prices, I should mention, are steadily rising. And, you know, that's an average as well across all of the different types of carbon credit out there. So you, know, you can have a carbon credit that's generated from putting a scrubber on a smokestack and kind of, you know, pulling, making sure that that, that carbon doesn't get released into the atmosphere. Um, that those are very cheap, right? Those cost probably two or $3 per ton. Um, and then there are, you know, really expensive credits like direct air capture, which costs, you know, sometimes up to 150 to $200 a ton. Uh, and then regenerative agriculture, uh, thus far within the voluntary space has been a, a, a relatively expensive uh, you know, compared to the norms uh, within the industry, um, credit of, of about 15 to $20 we've seen so far. And again, this is on its way up. Um, but we at SIBO really believe that if we're going to be, you know, inspiring full change or broad changes within the space of adoption of regenerative uh, practices, that we need to get closer to covering all of those costs. Uh, and it doesn't have to be completely from the carbon credit. There are opportunities to stack incentives either from, you know, government programs or from other sort of environmental marketplaces. Um, but we need to aim through all of those to get to a point where ultimately we cover all of the practice. Otherwise, you know, it will be niche. It will be along the, 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 the margins where we see adoption. Um, so, you know, I think that we, we, you know, ultimately we need to get to a point where we are paying um, not just $50 a credit, 
Uh, but remember that you know a, an acre of land only generates probably about typically a half a credit, um, sometimes more, sometimes it's, it's over over a full ton per acre. But typically, on average, it's about a half. So you know if, if you're paying um, you know uh, twenty dollars, for example, for a ton, and then uh, you know you divide that by two, that you know on a per acre basis, that's only about ten bucks. So you know we need the prices of this carbon to go up considerably if we want to get close to paying for all of it. Yeah, and and as you can see, this is just a, a quick Google search here that uh, that was done, just looking at um, a, a, a normalized carbon price index over over time. And again, this is not this is not for regenerative or farm based carbon prices, um, but it's kind of overall. And it goes up to about mid year last year, so you can see that interest in carbon is is going up and the the price index is you know hovering right there around twenty dollars today on the SIBO technology platform you can buy a a SIBO verified carbon credit for uh about twenty dollars a credit um but again it's it's very well recognized that when it comes to regenerative agriculture um when it comes to regenerative ag, there is a, like you said, Steve, there's a cost to actually implementing those practices. There's a cost to doing cover crops. There's a cost to doing no-till, right? It requires a new sort of, uh, you know, drill planter, um, you know, when it comes to time to actually plant the, the cash crop. Um, there are, you know, there are, you know, potential cost savings on uh, things like reduced nitrogen inputs when you're growing corn. Um but there, you know, there's there's all these other kind of costs uh, to 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 navigate. I know the USDA has now issued a, I believe it's a five dollar, um, you know, kind of coupon for crop insurance for people who are doing cover cropping. So there's kind of all these kind of stacked or overlapping, you know, incentives, not necessarily cash payments to the grower or to the landowner. Um, but this is where a lot of the, the uncertainty lies. And that's why we're having a session like this to help to, to demystify this as much as we can, because it's, it's always changing, um, right now. But I think that your, uh, you know, the, 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 um, kind of general rule there, right. Average cost or value of a carbon credit. Um, you know, you can, you can find them, uh, cheap, you can find them expensive, and really what needs to happen in SIBO's view, and in the view of a lot of other people as well, is that the cost of a carbon credit, or the price of a carbon credit, needs to be enough to actually create at that financial incentive for growers to, to implement those practices. Um, at the end of the day, growing, you know, farming is a business. It is a family business. It is a, it is a big business. And they have to be able to, uh, you know, to, to make ends meet and, and hopefully make a, you know, make a profit and, um, you know, and grow and expand uh, literally their operations. And if we're asking um, not just to maximize yield and commodity, you know, at, at current commodity prices, but also to take into consideration soil regeneration and climate health, um, you know, having those incentives in place through the vehicle of a carbon credit. I think makes a lot of sense. Agreed. I also think it's point, worth pointing out that, you know, from a demand perspective, from the buyers of these credits, credits are not created equal, right? There's a reason why some of this carbon is more expensive. Um, and, you know, as it relates to regenerative agriculture, this is a, a, you know, we call it charismatic carbon, right? There is a beautiful story to tell about the impacts this is having beyond the carbon that you're sucking out of the atmosphere, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the impact it has on soil health, on fortifying our food system, um, on, on, you know, creating new revenue streams for growers, on, you know, creating a, a pollinator habitats, right? There are all sorts of different, really valuable things that happen as a result of regenerative agriculture that a buyer of that carbon would want to talk about. Um, you know, if you're going to be offsetting your footprint, you know, you should have a portfolio of different approaches. And right. particularly if you operate within the food and agriculture space, purchasing carbon credits from, you know, through regenerative agriculture is absolutely crucial um, to, you know, telling a story that's relevant to your business. Right. Well, let's go um, ahead and talk briefly about scope one, two and three uh, emissions. And then wrap up on what is carbon farming and uh, regenerative ag. 
Sure. So, I mean, if you look at um, you know, when we talk about scope one, two, and three emissions, this is sort of the emission profile of a particular of an organization. Um, and so, you know, we define these uh, through these different scopes. Scope one is direct. So these are things that are kind of owned and operated by the company. Um, that's, you know, company facilities, uh, company vehicles that are owned, you know, a fleet of a fleet of, of delivery vehicles, whatever, if they're owned by the company, they qualify as scope one. Scope two is typically defined by per, you know, procured energy. Um, so, you know, the, the energy required to run your manufacturing lines or your data centers or uh, whatever else you do, um, you know, you do have some control over it. And that's why you'll see a lot of, you know, PPAs or power purchase agreements where, you know, big tech companies are going out and securing energy from a particular, uh, um, you know, uh, wind farm or from a solar farm. Um, and so that's scope two. Those are two things that, you know, typically as, as in terms of order of operations, a lot of companies start with trying to do as much as they can within scope one and scope two. Um, and then oftentimes scope three comes next. It's a little harder with scope three because you don't have as, as much direct control, but scope three is everything else. And scope three is both um, uh, you know, they're, they're both upstream and downstream. So these are things that, you know, would be a result of, uh, you know, for example, if you are a CPG company that creates crackers, um, you know, one of your upstream activities would be the, the, the production of the grain that goes into your crackers, right? So that both the, the on-farm activities, the transportation to get it to the processor, the processing itself, and then finally the, the delivery to you. And then downstream activities within the scope three context uh, involve the use of your product and service. Um, so, you know, once it gets into the hands of the consumer, how are they using it? Do you have any control over that, right? Or can you put your um, product into packaging that, you know, is more recyclable? Right. And so um, these are all things that as a company, you should theoretically have some control over um, to varying degrees, uh, obviously. And, and the, those that you don't have any control at that point, that's when offsets come into, into play to you know, further um, you know, influence your overall footprint. Well, that was that was really helpful, uh, Steve. And when we talk about, you know, insets and offsets, right, those those insets can be, you know, through. Um, you know, scopes one, two, and three, and, you know, the offsets are things that you can, you know, buy from, from you know, anywhere. It's that sponge helping to, to clean up the, uh, the overflowing bathtub. Um, but when we talk, you know, and when we talk about, uh, you know, SIBO and what, what our company does, um, you know, what we are in the business of, um, we, are a, we are a technology platform company focused on scaling regenerative agriculture. And when we talk about scaling regenerative agriculture, one of the things that makes the most, uh, that makes the most business sense are insets, um, offsets, and incentives for regenerative agriculture. And when you're talking about an organization, SIBO Technologies sells, tech, sells a technology platform that helps companies with ag somewhere in their supply chain or in their value shed um, manage, monitor, and incentivize and, and ultimately monetize their, their, um, their agricultural network or their, their uh, agricultural systems that, that are maybe part of their scope three emissions profile. Um, that means in your example, Steve, of the, you know, of the, of the CPG of the company producing crackers, um, or, you know, a, a company creating a, a soy-based, uh, you know, alternative protein, for example, they can um, see and create incentives for their growers who are all independent, right? These aren't controlled, compellable growers, but they can create an incentive structure and then monitor what's actually going on on those farms and on those fields in the way of farming practices like, like tillage, like cover cropping, um, like like reduced inputs and SIBO allows that verification at scale of those regenerative agricultural practices, which not only improve the soil and the, the and agricultural product, but also have this net benefit of um, of uh, of a carbon credit that that can be produced and then ultimately sold. Um, as part of that, we SIBO also has a carbon marketplace, a voluntary carbon marketplace, like we talked about at the very beginning. And we combine our land insights with the um, the farmers who enroll 
there's never any charge for a farmer who enrolls in our platform um, to actually create a, you know, and monitor their practices and then ultimately produce that, that SIBO verified carbon credit or SIBO um, uh, regenerative unit which can then be bought and sold for about $20 to today. And those proceeds go back to the farmer, less a, a management cost that that uh, price that comes back to SIBO, you know, if, and when they're, they're sold. Um, oh, and you, you brought this up. That's, that's true. So I saw that there was a question about, you know, what is SIBO actually in the business of? And I would be remiss um, if, if I didn't talk a, a little bit about that. Um, but let's let's briefly go. I know that we've been at this for uh, for a, about an hour, but let's talk about carbon farming, um, and uh, and let's get into uh, let's get into what is carbon um, farming and where does uh, SIBO play there? Steve, why don't you take that one? Sure. Uh, so I, I think you know what's important to point out here is that we see carbon markets as a mean to an end. Right. We see this as a, our focus as a company, as you mentioned, Billy, is to, to scale regenerative agriculture. Um, and, you know, for decades, we've been asking growers to deliver increasingly cheap, reliable, plentiful food. And by and large, they've delivered. Right. So so food is cheap and um, available. And, and and, you know, right now we're asking them to change and reprioritize uh, sort of how they go about making a living and operating within that ecosystem. And I don't think it's right really for us to, you know, sort of point the finger and, and blame them uh, for any of the environmental impact here. Um, they're running a business and, and, you know, ultimately we need to support this transition as if, if we as a society value, uh, you know, the, the impacts of doing things differently. And so I think that that's kind of the underlying, uh, um, you know, sort of reality that we as SIBO have recognized. And that's, you know, really, if we want to scale regenerative agriculture, we need to use these different mechanisms to help sustain it and support it. Uh, and so, you know, we see carbon markets as one way to do that. We see incentives, you know, uh, as, as another way where it's, you know, either through a, a particular stakeholder that wants to offer, you know, discounted products or if they want to, you know, procure regenerative grain, um, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, sponsor other ecosystem services like water, um, uh, you know, water um, quality. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of, you know, where we are in terms of, you know, really trying to uh, put together the value proposition to help growers make this change. And so, you know, this is kind of where what we've built so far as SIBO uh, and sort of how we've envisioned one of these many workflows that we'll continue to build out, um, which is, you know, a grower would uh, enroll in SIBO's carbon market, right? So they would give some information, they would attest to doing certain practices, um, both in the past and moving forward, um, and they would commit to doing it for a certain period of time. We at SIBO believe that it's important to allow for growers to make an annual commitment um, as well as longer commitments if, if you're able and willing to do so. Um, you know, most growers are renting land uh, and, and it's really difficult to make a 10-year commitment to doing the same practices each and every year uh, if you don't know you're going to be operating on that land next year or in a couple of years down the line. So, you know, uh, once a grower has enrolled, then SIBO's technology will automatically monitor and verify practices. Um, so we use remote sensing technology and satellite imagery to, to look at you know individual fields and see if a cover crop emerges and to determine what sort of tillage um, was taking place. Uh, SIBO's models, the SALIS model, then quantifies the carbon impact um, of that you know uh, updated uh, practice regime um, and validated practice regime, and then a third party would validate um, you know that everything that we've done is correct and that the the model that we're using is correct. And in some cases, they will go out and actually do uh, soil samples on the ground, uh, and then that is when the the credit actually gets registered. Um, you know, at SIBO, we have uh, our own sort of uh, marketplace where we can register credits, but we're also working with third-party registries, um, you know, for for you know to expand the types of buyers that will be interested. Yeah. Uh, finally, once those credits are available, then uh, and they sell, then the grower will get paid. So that's sort of you know the dynamic of how you know a grower who's adopting these new practices would see revenue um, as a result of them. Well, that's that's um, you know absolutely fantastic, Steve. I will point out. Uh, to the to the listening and the viewing audience, 
that you know right now SIBO is focused on row crops right and um, and your your kind of your main row crops in the US so that's going to be corn soy cotton and wheat along with um, uh, cover crop uh, you know detection and, and validation our technology allows us to scale uh, the the verification quantification um, and monitoring of fields across the United States because of of our um, you know of our of our satellite and computer vision approach and then our modeling based approach which is baselined with um, with with actual uh, you know on on field uh, data and, and soil sample but the ability to scale this across all um, millions of parcels in the United States is absolutely vital in order for regenerative agriculture and ultimately carbon farming as a climate solution um, to to take off. We don't believe that we should wait and do nothing until the perfect solution is found because the pace of technological innovation means that the perfect solution will always be what is current right here today and it will always be improving. And so um, you know that is that is our commitment to to technological innovation as well as making an impact right now um, and helping businesses monitor and um, and and verify and improve their uh, their supply chain and their value shed as well as individual growers and individual consumers to make a difference right in their you know in in their neighborhoods and in their in their backyard. Um, so I know we are we are over time. There's a bunch of questions rolling in right now. We will answer these on our blog. But Steve, I wanted to leave you with just a, a, a couple questions that that came in here. Um, do we have an idea of what kind of cropping systems provide the most credit potential? Like uh, you know, um, row crops, fruit trees, vegetables, and or, you know, grazing and, and pasture land. Um, you know, right now I said SIBO is focused on on the row crops, and there's I think there's different impacts for different uh, you know yeah. cropping systems. Well, that, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that um, you know there's still a lot to be learned. You know, we've we've heard a lot of really interesting uh, new research within the the pasture land space of uh, different types of. Um, you know, uh, uh, grazing techniques, you know, intensive rotational grazing and things like that, and how it can rapidly, um, you know, bring back uh, uh, topsoil. Um, you know, I think that the key for SIBO is that we rely currently on cropping systems that we can use, you know, satellite imagery and remote sensing to validate, to verify. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's important for us to be able to use satellite imagery to determine whether the practices um, that that we, you know, we're crediting for have actually happened. Right. That all of that ends up as an input into our model. And for every anything that we can't, you know, use satellite imagery for what would require sort of attestation as well as, um, you know, receipts. Right. For, for example, for nitrogen uh, purchases or, you know, as applied maps coming directly off of a farm management system. So we need to be able to verify it. And that's it's key that these things are scalable so that we can drive as much of that value back to growers as possible. As far as, you know, the different practices themselves within, you know, row crop system, mm -hmm. um, typically we, we, we see that the biggest impact comes when there is a, a stacking of practices or right. practices happening together. So, you know, no-till alongside cover crop, alongside, uh, you know, a reduction in, in nitrogen. Um, that's when you have major results as well. well as, you crop, know, frankly, along with crop, crop rotation is, as well. Yep. Right? Crop rotation yep. is really important. Um, uh, I, I know that we've just recently found, uh, you know, found, found that as a, as a very large statistical, um, driver of, of, uh, carbon sequestration. That's right. And, and, and frankly, it's, it's also a matter of, uh, you know, the Delta from what you were doing before, right? If right. you're using a conventional, uh, system with no rotation and, you know, a ton of, uh, fertilizer, uh, and no cover crops, et cetera, then that Delta is, is going to yield a big, credit. Um, so, you know, there's another question around baselines, um, you know, within, you know, the, the typical registries uh, and the systems through Vera and, and CAR, you know, the way that that works is that you look at the previous three years at a minimum of what practices were, and then compare that to the updated practice regime to determine what the credit uh, eligibility looks like. And we also believe that, you know, 
growers who have been doing the you know the the right thing for you know for regenerative practices and for the environment who have been doing that for years and years and in some cases even generations that they not that they ought not be bracketed out from the entire marketplace but that they have a a place too that you know rewards not just the bad actors um, but also the people who have been doing the right thing and that's why you see this continuum of of types of carbon credits and types of carbon markets that that can take place. And that's why it's not an either or, but really a both and, right? Where you can have a SIBO regenerative unit where any grower who's taking a, a making a difference and doing the practice, even if they've been doing it for generations, can still participate at one level. And then other growers, um, you know, who are making a, a radical shift in their in their practices, they might have uh, opportunity to participate at a you know at another place and at another level. And these are some of the things that are being developed in real time, and that's really what makes the technology and the marketplace and the the regulatory environment um, you know really an exciting place to be. And I think kind of bringing this discussion full circle into a close. Um, we started off by talking about this massive interest in carbon farming and carbon credits and in, in regenerative agriculture. Um, and I think that really shows that we are at kind of the leading edge of this second wave of climate and carbon awareness, where now we have the technology to be able to do something about this at scale. We have an awareness of the, the scope of the problem and the opportunities of the solution. Um, and we have, um, you know, the the ability to actually implement solutions in practical ways that will both help growers and landowners and the the commodities folks, as well as the the business folks, you know, buying and selling the grain and turning it into, you know, the food that we eat or the food that our food eats, or even the the products that uh, that we use. So it's a really exciting time to be here uh, talking about carbon farming, carbon credits, and carbon markets, I can say with certainty that um, all of you who are watching, whether you're watching the recording or what joining us live today, um, you know, expect more things to come and expect change and keep an eye on SIBO technologies to be uh, leading the innovation and the thought leadership in this space. So. With that, on behalf of uh, my colleague Steve and everyone at SIBO Technologies, I want to thank you so much for your time today, uh, for taking some time out uh, to watch and to participate with us. We will follow up with your questions if we did not get to them um, on our blog post. And as always, please do feel free to reach out to us at SIBO Technologies. You can reach us at SIBOTechnologies.com. And we are more than happy to set up a conversation with one of our carbon experts, with Steve, with myself, or even uh, some of our, our crop scientists and modeling scientists and, and soil scientists. If um, you've got some more of those detailed questions, we'd be more than happy to have those conversations with you. So pay attention to this space. Come back next time for our next uh, handful of, of webinars. And we look forward to seeing you on the ground. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.